in your life. Good afternoon and welcome to the May meeting for the Human Rights and Equity Commission. We'll turn it over to Joanne, our co-chair, vice chair of HREC uh, to lead us through this meeting. And the next slide is just gonna give us an idea of what maybe what the agenda looks like for this evening. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see your faces. Um, good to be in community. Um, my name is Joanne Mina. I have the pressure of serving as Human Rights and Equity Commission Vice Chair. And as you see, we have a um, more or less very packed agenda. Um, but first, we're gonna start off with roll call. Uh, if that is okay, <clears throat> Cassandra, could you please lead us? Absolutely. Joanne Mina. Presente. Carolyn, Carolyn Peacock Biggs. Here. Aaron Mayer. Linda Long. Uh, here. Mo Mitchell. Sergio Retemal. Here. Jeff Kitchens. Here. Jasmine Wilder. Cameron Fisher. Here. Steven Seagal. And Manoj Alapuria. And Brittany Brown. Thank you, Cassandra. Absolutely. Um, well, we cannot move forward without uh, recognizing where we stand, the history that has brought us here. Do we have a, a volunteer for the land acknowledgement? I believe it's open for anyone to jump in to do so. Do we have a volunteer for the land acknowledgement? Sure, I'll read it. Thank you, yeah, John. I'd be happy to. Um, land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the beautiful land known as Bend, Oregon, north of the Columbia River, is the original homelands of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. The Confederated Tribes ceded this land in the Treaty of 1855 while retaining regular and customary hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. The Wanalama, Warm Springs, Wasco, Wasco, and Northern Paiute people inhabited this area in certain seasonal times that clearly established their presence. It is also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Celilo Falls trading grounds. This trade route expanded the impact of commerce between tribal nations. We acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. It is our hope that the guests, that guests continue to honor and care for this land. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> well, with that, um, we do have some fabulous guests that are gonna share some very cool information. But before that, we do have to approve last, last minutes, minutes, no, last, last meetings, minutes. <laughs> so can I have a motion uh, to approve the minutes? A motion that last meetings, minutes be approved. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Do we have a second? A second. Thank you, Erin. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. We are moving quick. Um, <clears throat> so are we ready for our first guest? Um, thank you, first and foremost, Stephanie, for coming in after a very, very, very busy couple of weeks. So they have had very late night meetings, early morning meetings, in between meetings, <laughs> to figure out how we can justfully administer our city's budget. So with that, bienvenida, Stephanie. I'll see thank you. To you. Thank you, Joanne. And thank you so much for the opportunity to provide some quick updates um, on, on the budget, on council goals, um, and also on our equity and inclusion director recruitment. So um, as Joanne alluded to, the city has been working hard to develop and um, present to our budget committee, a budget that we feel really reflects the council goals. Um, that meeting happened um, on May 22nd and 23rd, and the proposed budget with some very minor, minor modifications was approved by the budget committee. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the structure of our budget committee, it includes the city council plus seven community volunteers. So that was a, a, a really big accomplishment. 
that budget along with the council goal work plan will go to council for adoption on June 21st. So a lot of really exciting things happening. I do um, wanna note that the Human Rights and Equity Commission work plan was integrated into the council goals under our accessible and effective city government um, tied to our equity guiding principle. And so that work um, not only is a priority of this commission, but also of the council. Yay. Supporting that work is um, our new equity and inclusion director. I am absolutely thrilled to share that Andres Portella will be the city's equity and inclusion director. Um, he will start on July 10th. Andres brings a wealth of experience in creating um, and leading equity programs and initiatives. Um, most recently, he has um, created the Office of Health, Health Equity for Pima County, Arizona. Prior to that, he established the Office of Equity for the city of Tucson. So between that, that professional experience, a lot of community engagement and lived experience, we really feel like Andres is gonna be an incredible addition to our already fabulous equity team that includes Cassandra and Lisa Larson. Once Andres is here, we'll be um, launching another recruitment. Um, so we currently have a vacant position that was our volunteer coordinator. We are recasting that position to align with council goals and the Human Rights and Equity Commission work plan. That position will focus on community engagement, but also the development and implementation of the equity framework that I know is something that many of you are working on right now. So a lot of exciting things happening, and I look forward to coming back to this group and sharing updates as it progresses. Well, 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 let's not hurry up. We, do we have some questions? You're not, we're not letting you off the hook just yet. Uh, do we have uh, questions from commissioners? Would you say Andre's name again? Just it's Andres Portella. Thank you. We'll be sending out a formal announcement closer to um, Andres's start date and include some additional background. Um, Cassandra and I were just talking and um, we anticipate that he'll be joining the this commission for your July meeting. So you'll have a chance to, to meet him. <clears throat> Any other questions? You know, I almost have so many. I don't want to pick one yet. I'd rather just hang back a little bit and, and read about them and see what and hear from them and uh, th I, then I'll prioritize my questions, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it's, thank you. Uh, I, yes. it's not, I just wanted you to know I'm not quiet because I don't have any questions. I, I do, but it's just like, don't want to pick one right now, I think. <laughs> awesome, well, thank you, Linda. I think you express all of our eagerness to get to meet Andres and see what has been his learning in Arizona and you know, you know how we can learn from that. Um, Stephanie, uh, regarding the budget, um, I am thrilled to hear that uh, the council has incorporated the Human Rights and Equity Commission work plan. So could you give us a little sense, maybe not numbers, but a yes or no. Mm -hmm. Do we have funds to help with navigation of discrimination um, and connecting folks to DOJ or, you know, whoever they need support from? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So not knowing um, exactly what funds were going to be needed to support each of the actions within your action plan, we have included some dollars within the consulting budget, as well as in some of our other materials and services that we can apply to the priority project. So um, there is, there's, in working with Mickey and working with Cassandra, we feel like there's sufficient funds in the equity budget to move that work forward. Perfect. We want to make sure that when Andres comes into the team, you know, he's got something to work with. Awesome. Awesome. Any other questions? Going once. Okay, I do have one more question, Stephanie. Um, so we, uh, you share that the budget, it's seven community members and members of council, and they really, you know, work these out to, to bring us, right, something for the community. What were some changes that maybe you've seen that this budget stands out different from others? Just if, you know, I want to know if, like, 
is, is this work being impactful and can you tell, right? Because we're not in those meetings. So we really don't know if there is that growth going. Stephanie, not to interrupt, but we are over the five minutes that we've allotted for you, but we could put this on the bike rack or if you'd like time to, I yield it to you if you'd like to, but just as the timekeeper. So I think, Thank you. Joanne, if I can just give you a really brief response, and then I'm happy to um, come back and talk about this in greater depth. So as the budget was developed, it was focused on council goals. So as, as you know, we, we went over the council goals, there's, there's goals, um, very similar to the last one, um, equity is still a guiding principle. We're focused on environment and climate, the accessible and effective city government, um, housing and sustainable development, transportation and infrastructure, and public safety. Um, so those council goals really drove the budget process. Thus, as I just mentioned, we made sure that there's funding in the equity budget to move forward the Human Rights and Equity Commission work plan. I would also say that um, there was a lot of community engagement. Um, it was advisory body recommendations. It was listening sessions. It was roundtables that helped inform the council goal. So I see that as really the process that got us to where we were, where council really listened to community needs um, to make sure that those are where we're, we're placing our limited financial resources. But I would be happy to come back at another meeting and do a deeper dive into that. Thank you so much. I just think that the public uh, wants us to be, you know, fiscally responsible. And so thank you so much for sharing. All right. Are we ready to then open the floor? Thank you, Stephanie, again. Um, and then with us, we have Sarah and Ross. Sarah and Ross have been working very digitally on a variety of topics. And today we're going to learn about transportation. Yes. Okay, adelante. I need to share my screen, but it's saying, ah, here we go. Sorry, Sarah, that was me. Oh, no worries at all. All right. And hello. I'm Sarah Hudson. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a senior management analyst in the city manager's office, and I end up being a project manager for a number of policy-based initiatives around transportation and infrastructure. I am uh, Russ Grayson Heham. I am the chief operations officer for the city of Bend. Good evening. And today we're going to talk to you first and foremost about the forthcoming transportation fee, um, something that we're going to be implementing um, this year into next year. But to even kind of get to that point, it's really helpful to provide some background, some context on um, the transportation funding landscape within the city. So Russ will kind of start us off by giving that overview. Um, and then I'll really delve into what the transportation fee is, how it works and what we're um, looking to do. And ultimately um, we'll kind of end an ask of this group um, to see if we can get um, a representative um, to participate in some round tables to help kind of form that. So we'll get to that a little later in the presentation. Um, and then just to start, this is kind of connected to a, a council goal to um, implement a transportation fee, which is um, a recommended funding strategy out of our transportation system plan. So just to provide that context that it is connected to that master planning effort that involved extensive community engagement. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna kind of give a kickoff and kind of uh, dovetails into the conversation that you're just having with Stephanie around the city's budget. So I'm gonna kind of give a holistic view of some of the budget items, not an in-depth uh, analysis, but try to put this all in context for why we're, why we're doing this right now. Um, so I, I'm fairly confident that a lot of people understand our budget constraints, but I'm gonna go into a little bit more, but uh, we're gonna just start out with a high level illustration of for every dollar of property tax that you pay, where does it go to all the different taxing jurisdictions? You can tell that we receive about 22% of every dollar that comes in um, taxing districts. We have an extremely low tax rate. Um, we're the second most tax rate in the state, the lowest tax rate among comparable cities. Um, and it is a significant challenge for funding all the different needs that the community wants and asks for 
um, in a one of the fastest growing cities in the country. You can imagine why you know we all, we're all struggling around funding and to kind of fund all the different programs that everyone's asking for. So the majority of the funding that goes into transportation and all the other programs, the money that helps supports this committee and the goals of this committee and a lot of other initiatives in the cities is really coming out of the general fund, which is the most discretionary fund that we have. When you think of other, other areas, they're more restricted. We have, we have utility rates that people pay for utility bills. Those go directly to the services of providing water, sewer, and stormwater services to the city. Same with when you pay permit fees at the permit counter. That's, that's paying for staff to review and process those permits. The discretionary funds is, is the general fund. And the graph on the left is a representation of where that money comes from to begin with, which is the majority of its property taxes, whichever if you own a piece of property, you get a tax bill, that goes in that 22% of every dollar that you pay goes into the city's general fund. We also receive revenue from what we call short-term rental um, taxes that are paid for hotels, um, Airbnbs, and things like that. We also receive money from franchise fees, which is basically a fee that we charge utilities to utilize the public right away to run their systems. We get annual revenue off of that. And then we've got a whole host of kind of other small revenue sources that are not going to come in that go into the general fund. The graph on the right is where it goes. And as you can tell, the majority of it goes to public safety. That's just, um, this includes, this does not change and it includes the assumption of the recent fire levy that we believe has passed. We're still waiting for the final um, verification from the county on that. So between 75 to 80% of our general fund goes to public safety. And then all the other demands and requests um, go to all the other departments for that remaining 20 to 25%. So we get a little portion of the pie and we're asked to do a lot with it. A big part of that goes to streets, but that goes into the overall operations of streets. That includes not only maintaining our streets and pavement preservation, but also street operations, winter operations, curb ramps, striping, you know, all the things that we get requested to do. And then there's a whole other host of growth management things and HREC and climate policies that kind of all go after those remaining funds as well as some administrative services. Another thing that usually comes up is, well, the, the market and bend is booming, so we must just be rolling in the tax dollars. Well, we are limited by what's called measures five and 50. So we cannot, based on those measures, we cannot increase our tax rate. It's almost, it's really at the state level to kind of change the state statutes around that, uh, which is not likely to happen anytime in the near future. So we are locked into that present tax rate. Um, and there's also the other measure is the, that that assessed value of what's used to determine your taxes can only increase at about 3% per year. So if your, if your house goes up or your property goes up 20 to 50% over a time period, we don't maintain that same assessed value on the revenue that we receive. So we're locked into a very slow growth revenue source when we look at property taxes. And that's really all that this is illustrating. To give you some comparisons, um, here are our comparable cities uh, in Central Oregon. Um, if you do an apples to apples comparison, if we had the same tax rate as the city of Redmond, we'd be saving $10 million more in revenue a year. Um, and we probably wouldn't be having the same conversation that we're about to have. An important thing to remember about measures five and 50 was it was really intended to um, provide more power to the community to determine what services they want. And so that's, that's one of the concepts behind why those, in, those tax rates were locked, where the cities would come back for individual requests and other revenue sources for specific purposes. The GEO bond is a, the transportation bond that was passed in 2020 is a perfect example. The fire levy is another example of those additional requests of you pay this levy, you receive this service type of thing. So now I'm going to kind of ground this into the world of transportation, which we could give you, you know, three days of an in-depth seminar on transportation. I'm going to try to condense that to about five minutes here. So our transportation system is guided by our, what's a master plan for the city, which is called the transportation system plan. That was recently updated in 2020. It is a, it basically looks at our transportation system, the existing state of our transportation system, and then what demands need to be placed on that for the anticipated growth that we're going to see over the next 20 years. It was developed over two years. It had a wide variety, this is all pre-COVID, had a wide variety of public involvement, which I'll talk about um, here. And it looks like, looks at all portions of our system. What, like, how do we want our vehicular system to work? What are our needs there? Our bike ped systems, our transit, how do all these systems work together to provide a coordinated um, 
transportation system. It was all, trying to balance the needs of all those different users across the system and not just the vehicle, but also looking at economic development, how we move freight and how we move people around town. Uh, another component that we went into a much deeper dive and this is all kind of guided by state requirements, um, but uh, we took deeper dives into several areas, especially around some of the project planning that was needed, as well as a deep dive into the financial plan. We, you have to develop a financial plan, but instead of going at the high level of what the state requires, we actually took a deep dive, which I'm gonna go into and looked at how we can increase our transportation funding. So again, this is just a, a quick, uh, overview of what that public engagement process happened for that transportation system plan. We had several different committees and groups. Um, we had a, the city council and the MPO board, which were kind of the, the guiding policymakers on this. We had a steering committee made up of a lot of represent, representatives of those different groups and also ODOT. The, the Citizen Transportation Advisory Committee and CTAC, that was the main advisory group that we were using over that two-year process to work through all the different angles of the transportation system. And then there was working groups that came out of that. One of them was the funding group that then reported back to CTAC, to the steering committee, and then eventually up to the decision makers at city council. So in that system, these are the kind of um, revenue sources that were, uh, were discussed and recommended to help fund the transportation system. Transportation funding is very unique. We do not have a sustainable um, funding, complete funding source that comes into uh, the transportation world like we do with utilities. We have utility rates that we can adjust based off of the needs of the operations and maintenance and capital needs of the utility system. We do, do, we do get some revenue in from gas tax and other state programs, but the, a large portion of what comes into the transportation system is from that kind of discretionary revenue and allocations from the general fund. Um, so we received money from um, the general obligation bond that was passed, system development charges, which are fees that are assessed at the time of development, which I know Joanne is becoming very familiar with, with her involvement in that group. Obviously, the city's general fund, there are some recurring block grants that we do get from the federal government, as well as some revenue from the state. We talk about franchise fees. We also have urban renewal is another way for capital to build new projects around town. And then we are actively pursuing, that's one of Sarah's other jobs of trying to find um, all the uh, grant applications and opportunities with all the recent uh, infrastructure bills that have been passed at the federal level, as well as chasing funds at the state level. So this is just a quick graph of our funding need over that 20 year planning horizon, which the, the transportation system plan is looking at. The, the headlines are when you adjust this for inflation, we have about a billion dollars worth of need over the next 20 years, just in the transportation system. That includes both capital as well as operations and maintenance. And we have about half of that figured out with our existing revenue sources. So again, I just like to always stop with that billion dollar number, which is a staggering number to think about when you've got a town of 100,000 people. But a lot of that has to do with the rapid growth that we have. Um, in that we do include O&M, funding of around $6 million per year, but that is also part of the funding gap that we're, we're talking about. One of the things that we're trying to do with the transportation fee is reduce the need for always looking at the discretionary fund of the general fund for sustainable funding into transportation. So if we can, one, we don't have the general fund money that we need to operate the system at the, at the level that the community expects, but also as this committee is fully aware, there are a lot of other needs and competing to, um, desires and wants from the community where that general where those general fund dollars could be spent but they've been prior you know a big portion of them have been prioritized for the transportation system so these are the recommended funding tools and the current status is again um, this this is again it comes out of the transportation system plan so the items in green are current funding strategies that are already in place which include the general obligation bond that was 190 million dollars that was passed in 2020 urban renewal funding, which is, we have three urban renewal areas, Juniper Ridge, the core area of town and down by Murphy. Juniper Ridge and the core area are generating enough increment now that we're actually using that to build capital projects in there, um, such as Second Street between Franklin and Greenwood. That is a capital project that came out of the urban renewal funding that Allie is in charge of helping work through the, her committees on how we wanna use that. We're, the yellows are what is being worked on right now. The first one is we are updating, we're right in the middle. So there's other project of uh, updating the transportation system development charge methodology, and then the transportation fee, which is why we're in front of you today. Then what's in blue is the next layer of potential funding sources. But when you, the dollar signs represent the magnitude of funding. 
that is available from those sources. So we're kind of going after the biggest, the biggest potential first, and then we're going to go down to the next level after that. We're pretty sure in the discussion of the transportation fee that those items in blue are going to start to get discussed about, you know, if, well, if we can't, if we want to cover other things that we don't want to put on the transportation fee, what other revenue sources are, do we want to look at? And that's probably going to be Sarah's next round of work after we get through the transportation fee. If we want to look at seasonal fuel taxes or food and beverage, which those are recommended to go after tourism and the impact of tourism on the transportation system. Some of those require votes um, in, a general, in, a, in a general election. Others require the county involvement in them as well, um, such as the vehicle registration fees. And then there are other things around local improvement districts, but that's more geographically focused to, um, to help build certain improvements in certain areas. A lot of, understand, giving you a lot of information, I'm just trying to fly high to kind of give you the context, but definitely here to answer any questions that you might have. So just real quick, we're gonna talk about um, the importance of street maintenance and, and what our transportation group does. So these are kind of the, the kind of the bread and butter of what they do every day. And we're very grateful that they're out there sweeping the roads, making sure the traffic signals are working, um, making sure we're plowing the roads in the winter. They have programs of uh, trying to fill in sidewalk gaps and you see the ramp, ADA ramps being uh, removed and replaced all over town. Um, we have lands, we have a, one landscape crew that's trying to chase all the medians and all the other landscaping all over town that the city's under control and they do things like graffiti and removal. Um, so this is where a lot of the general fund money that goes into the group now, that's what it's funding. And then we always, as we go into, we also need to make sure that we maintain our asset of, the, of our street conditions. So how do we talk about this? So the, I'm not gonna get too deep in this, but we use an index that's called the Pavement Condition Index or PCI which is basically a report card of how our roads are. So if you've driven down Newport or driven through the new 15th roundabout at Wilson, that would have a PCI of 100, A plus, right? It's just like a grade book, easy way to think about it. That is a newly paved road, it's, it's in perfect condition. Then you start working your way down and when you get down in the lower levels, that's where you start to see what we call the alligator cracking. Um, and the further, the further you go down the road, the more expensive it takes to maintain. Um, so when you start to see all that cracking, like on the far right, the only way to fix that is basically rip the road out and replace it. When you move up to the, the kind of good and fair categories, there are other treatment techniques, whether it's we're doing crack filling or we're doing um, like a, a, you can do grind and inlays and other things, chip seals. There's a lot of different technical aspects that are a lot cheaper. And you, can, you, can spend, you can spread that dollar a lot further. So if you translate that into the city of Bend Streets, we do a, we do a survey every year of what the conditions of our roads are. Um, and you can kind of see coming out of the recession on the left, we were in a downward trend. Um, and if you were here during that time, that's when you're starting to see potholes more than you're seeing now at the, coming out of winter. They were everywhere, especially in the arterial and collectors. You remember those times. So by the time we got into about 2013, 14 and 15, councils at that time, realized that we needed to make a turn. So they started doing one-time direct allocations every budget season that just like what, when we went through last week to get additional money, um, there were lower in reserves and, and, and taking, you know, prioritizing funds to improve the PCI. And you can start to see that upward trend that occurred after that decision point leading up to basically pre-COVID. Um, and then we kind of leveled out. So right now we're currently sitting around a 75, 76 in our index and the industry standard is 80. 82, I think, I don't know, 83. Um, so that's where we want to try, to try to trend to. But we've also, with all the other competing needs, when you think of houselessness and other programs, making those one-time uh, discretionary allocations of additional general fund have been challenging. So we're trying to find another revenue source for in that. And it, the other thing to realize is on um, the lower right in that yellow box, that's the amount, the value of our asset of all of our transportation system. So we have 882 lane miles worth close to about a billion dollars of an asset that we're trying to maintain and operate across the city. So that's a high level conversation. Now, now listen to the important stuff that Sarah's <laughs> going to talk about. Thanks, Russ. Um, well, hopefully, I mean, there's a lot of information there, but hopefully provides the context of the transportation funding gap we're working with, how we're trying to be very thoughtful about what tools that we're using to fill that gap and also kind of that importance of that preventative maintenance piece that um, keeping the good roads good kind of saves us money. It becomes a more expensive problem down the line. So all of these things are swirling with why we're talking about the transportation fee now. So in terms of what a transportation fee is, 
Um, this essentially would be a line item that appears on the utility bill. So all utility rate payers, both residents and businesses would pay um, a flat fee per month. And that money would go toward um, the operations um, and maintenance budget and other uses to be determined, which is something I'll get into in a moment. But the idea is that we're essentially treating the transportation system like a utility. So we all benefit from a well-maintained multimodal transportation system. And even if you do not drive, you still benefit from a well-maintained system for things like garbage hauling and delivery and school bus routes. So um, there's many ways in which we impact and tap into the transportation system. So again, the transportation fee is a user fee. It's regularly assessed on the utility bill. Um, the use of funds is determined locally. So there's a lot of flexibility in how those funds can be used, but it's a really common funding tool in Oregon. And most often in, in every community is used for kind of those preservation, street preservation activities, but it can also be used for other th things. So some communities use it for bike and pedestrian projects, um, sidewalk infill, things like that. So there is some of that flexibility in use. And a public vote is not required to implement this fee. So council does have the authority to approve this fee. Um, and based on discussions with council and it being goals, it's not a question of um, if we will implement it, we will. It's just a matter of trying to kind of shape the framework of what that looks like and some of the details of it. So as I mentioned, it is a common funding tool in Oregon. This slide shows a map of the other communities that have a transportation fee. Um, it goes by many names, um, sometimes called a road user fee, street maintenance fee, things like that. Um, so it can differ in name. It can also differ in how it's structured, what portion is charged to residents, what portion is charged to businesses, um, how it's used. All of that is locally determined by ordinance. Um, it's really... Um, common to calculate how to assess this fee um, on something called trip generation formulas. This is a really common method where if you are a certain category of use, you have an estimated impact on the road system. So say if you are um, a Costco or some sort of high traffic retail, you would in theory pay more money than um, a business that does not generate as much impact to the road system. So they use a really common tool is using the Institute of Transportation Engineers manual um, to come up with those um, estimates. So that's one way um, that's really common to kind of back into how much um, different users are charged per month. So again, just to highlight, why are we talking about this now? So as I think we've really kind of highlighted, there's a critical need for that operations and maintenance funding right now. Um, a decline in that pavement condition index or PCI will only cost us more later. Um, so streets that are in very poor condition can cost um, anywhere from four to 20 times more to repair than if it's in good condition. So that idea of keeping the good roads good. And then there's a kind of a maintenance backlog that will only continue to grow if you don't address kind of those issues happening now. We also have a lot of support, but no existing funding for a number of programs that came out of the transportation system plan. We didn't go into this in detail, but there's a lot of, there's about nine programs kind of bike and pedestrian focused out of the transportation system plan that we're saying, this is critical. We should implement this in the near term. We don't have funding for that. So that's on the table through these conversations of do we wanna um, allocate some of this funding toward some of those uses as well. Also, there's efficiencies in completing this work at the same time as that system development charge methodology update, just based on how that methodology is based on that ITE manual I mentioned just a few moments ago. Um, so there's synergy with how that's calculated and how we might potentially um, structure this fee. Now I wanna just go over direction we've received from council, where we are in the process and some next steps. So we went to a couple of work sessions earlier this year to talk with council. What is the scope of the fee? What do you want it to cover? Um, and so we had some good conversation around that. And it seems like there really is agreement. Yes, we need sustainable operations and maintenance funding now. But like we've alluded to, there's that flexibility. We can determine if we wanna use this money um, for other things as well. So there seemed to be some interest in funding those um, near-term programs out of the transportation system plan that I just mentioned a moment ago. And we could also consider if we wanna use any funding toward infrastructure capital. So that might be um, improvements to the bike and pedestrian network, 
uh, above and beyond what the transportation system plan outlined or some safety improvements, or sidewalk infill. So there, there's again, some options there. Um, and council um, indicated their preference that while they would like to kind of see all of this kind of on the table and how we'd like to fund it, they really wanna do some community engagement to figure out, okay, what does the community want? What would the rate tolerance be? Because the more that you do, that potentially more that the fee would be. So there's a, that direct relationship. So we need to see what feels appropriate to fund with this particularly fund, funding mechanism or what might be for another funding tool like Russ mentioned um, that might be kind of leveraging tourism to the area or things like that. So we came back to a council work session and kind of laid out different communication strategy options. As I mentioned earlier, council does have the authority to disapprove this fee, but they didn't they don't want to do that. They want to work with community members and get that input. And so they indicated their prevent, um, preference for kind of this um, advisory group engagement path of, in, um, of getting feedback. So we would like to conduct a couple of round tables, which is ultimately what I really um, want to ask this group about to see if there could be um, interest in participating in that. But we'd be look we'd look at having round tables later this summer. So one in August, one in September, and potentially one in October, depending on how the conversation evolves, to go over some of those things that we just talked about. So how are we going to use um, the revenue from a transportation fee? How do we um, think about some of the equity components of this work? So understanding that we're kind of getting hit on a lot of sides with a bunch of fee increases and knowing that this would will place a burden on some of our community members. How do we mitigate that impact? What mechanisms um, are available in the forms of exemptions or waivers or discounts. Um, that rate tolerance piece, how much do we want to fund out of a transportation fee? And then kind of as part of that conversation, what other funding tools should we be looking toward next, um, knowing that we have that really big gap that we need to fill um, with a number of different tools. So those would be the items that are discussed in that roundtable format. Um, this slide just kind of shows a timeline of, of where we are. So in Q1 of this year is when we had those work sessions and we received direction from council on the scope and our engagement strategy. Now we're in Q2. This is um, the arrows kind of indicate advisory group touch points. So Russ and I have been going to um, various advisory groups and asking for participation in these roundtables. So we're really in this process of developing our work plan, engaging advisory groups, and then we have um, formed an internal steering committee. Uh, Q3 of this year, we wanna have those round tables, as I mentioned, and then through that develop what the rate structure would look like and the implementing ordinance with the details of what this fee will cover. Um, we'd hope to at that point come back to the different advisory groups with the recommendations that we heard out of the round table process um, to get kind of final thoughts and feedback. And, the goal would be to have council action by the end of this year. So approval of a fee by end of this calendar year um, for the fee to appear on utility bills probably sometime mid next year, just because it takes a little bit from once it's approved to actually kind of get this set up in our utility billing system. So that's kind of the overall timeline that we're envisioning at this point. So again, the roundtable participation, we're thinking two to three roundtables, one in August and September, potentially one in October. Um, two and a half hours each, just to give a sense of what the potential time commitment would be. Um, we're looking at offsite locations, maybe OSC Cascades. And then as mentioned, we'd really be getting into the details of how we're gonna use this funding, rate tolerance, um, equity considerations, accountability to so the city being stewards of these funds. How do folks wanna see this reported out and decisions made of how funds are used? and then those other funding tools. So with that, um, kind of curious about uh, a volunteer and a backup from the group. I don't know if that's something we want to. Uh, I think that is a premature question okay. at the moment. Sure. I think that it's important that HREC gets a chance to uh, process the invitation, mm -hmm. assess our capacity, because we also have three internal work groups and we're supporting SDCs. Right. So um, by when should we have an answer to you? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say if maybe by the end of 
I mean, technically, I think we're looking at the round table not beginning till very beginning of August. So I guess technically you could go up until that point, but if someone felt it, it felt like there was the capacity um, and openness to doing it, um, maybe even by the end of this month, just so I can kind of be in com conversation with that person to get details and make sure it's on calendars and, and things like that. So I have a question, and this is more for the, the HREC group is, so I'm sure these asks have come in the past since the commission was stood up. What is sort of the process that we've used in the past to? Um, I would say, Jeff, that it's kind of new and we're building it. Uh, we don't have uh, exactly process yet, um, but um, we got to wait on our leadership team to kind of be revamped. So we have to wait on our share to kind of lead that way. In the past, or at least, you know, when I newly joined, there was a more robust leadership team. And I think there was a little more, you know, more hands on deck. Um, but I think that we need to internally organize. We're having a clear process for, you know, screening. Um, and actually we do have a rubric more or less a sample draft rubric that we use. Um, but also the idea of that tool was that anyone can use it. Um, so. so and, this, yeah, and we've seen in other committees, you know, a lot of times people, there, there, there's a sense of volunteering, like who, who has time, wants to kind of know what the schedule is, is there interest? Um, the, the goal of this is that you're representing this group in those discussions and you're kind of the conduit of a lot of times groups may have a discussion at one of their meetings about kind of what they would like to achieve or, or represent as we go into these kind of larger stakeholder meetings. And then that's kind of like your conduit to put information in and then also receive feedback back from the, those representatives. And then as Sarah alluded to, then we will also be coming back at the at the conclusion of those to kind of kind of give you the overall kind of recommendation of what's being carried forward to council to receive additional feedback and questions, concerns, guidance around that. Um, and then all that is kind of relayed to council because they would be the ultimate decision maker of this at one of their future council meetings towards the end of this year. Is this something Cassandra could do for a follow up? Yep. Um, um, yeah, I think that I'm just asking. Oh no, no, that's so I, I was think, you've done for other. Yeah. And I, they, I think that that's kind of what I wanted to uh, you know, give us a little bit of time. Yeah. I understand that, you know, if you're eager, you're eager. You know, I've jumped before, but we do have some internal homework within HREC, and we need to get a little organized before Jeff runs off and says yes. <laughs> Well, there, there is the question, is there, I mean, and this is a discussion for the committee to have, is there interest in, in being involved in this process? Because this will never, this won't be the first request that is made around these type of things. We have a lot of initiatives, a lot of things. There are several areas where I think this is important for this committee to weigh in on because there are some significant equity issues involved here. I know there's a lot of technical side on what we're trying to achieve on the transportation, but it's really how big is this fee? How are, how are we looking at across all the various members of our community? Kind of programs and assistance programs should we be thinking about kind of what Sarah talked about. So there, there are other things where you may say, no, we're good. We don't need to be involved in those things. That's fine. But we, that's why we always want to give the opportunity for the committee to make the choices. But we want to let you know that it is, it will be moving through the system this year. And if there is interest and involvement, then you can work with Cassandra yeah. and she can work directly with Sarah to answer questions, get information. Really, we just need to know when those meetings are scheduled, is there going to be a representative there? And and Russ and Sarah, thank you so much for the presentation. I would say also we'll extend the invitation to members who are not present this evening, which is a, a number of them. And then, Joanne, if it works for you, we can come back to see capacity. And I can also check individually with members to see if they're, you know, let me know via email or text if this is something you're interested in. We'll streamline you to get you connected to these um, these um, listening sessions. So yeah. uh, one more thing before we move on to the next topic. I know time is pressing, um, but in your presentation, Ross, I saw that there was recommendations on how to go about this funding. Who provided those recommendations? Because it seems like we had a pool where you could go for federal and yep. state money, and then that was not part of the recommendations. Well, we're, we're 
so the, the main recommendations came through what, what existing revenue sources do we already know about and we already are taking advantage of. And then that funding group that was created through the transportation system plan took a deep dive into the universe of funding options that are out there and looked at what, what's applicable for this market in our city in particular, what is the potential revenue sources? How can those revenue sources be used? Because some of them, when you go different avenues, it can be restricted for certain things like geo bonds can only be used for capital, not for operations and maintenance. So they were just evaluating all those things and saying what had a realist, what has a realistic chance of working in this community. Those recommendations were given to CTAC to be incorporated into the transportation system plan, which basically worked its way up to council um, and got approved and adopted in that document. So that's the roadmap that we've been using to talk about additional funding for the transportation system. So there's a lot of realism there that may trump equity or other funds of, you know. Yeah. I sent you some, actually, before Jeff got your question, Sarah, I sent you a couple of links with grants. Uh, Philanthropy Digest is one place where you can go see nationwide, there's stuff for government, but I feel like um, it's important that we keep those other funding sources in mind and not like, you know, block, like close that door kind of thing. Um, because we have to be mindful that the United States has the biggest uh, defense budget. So our people are already paying enough taxes for all of our roads to be shiny and you know new. Uh, so those are important nuanced dialogues that we need to have. And Jeff had just, a question and then Cameron? just just to yeah, Linda's also online. So and and then we've gotta we've gotta move on from that. <laughs> okay, who goes first? Uh, Linda. 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 She got um, yeah, so I think it's absolutely critical for this uh, for for HREC to follow uh, their their process and this and this entire conversation from the beginning, because um, really, if 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 our work is equity, then that is a uh, it's it's all encompassing, right? It, it touches every aspect. It, in order to achieve equity, we have to touch every aspect, um, virtually every one. Of, of how we arrange ourselves, how we distribute goods, goods and services, how all of this stuff works. So um, I'm saying that, um, like, so um, for me, it's important to be a, a voice for equity that talks about, like, what about money for public transportation and more effective forms of it that can reach the populations that need it the most? like the homeless, right? So um, I just think if we get into these conversations really early, we can start to think about what are small, what are some portions of money that we can set aside um, for alternative solutions, more creative and effective solutions, instead of lengthening. So if I'm making sense, I hope I am. Yes, I think Linda, you share that what we all feel, there's some interest. We just need to negotiate our capacity. Jeff, you wanna? No, I'm good. Your I'll wait till the end of the agenda. For yeah, I just, Sarah and Russ, thank you so much. That's very fascinating. Um, seriously, it is. Uh, and one just tiny question, given we're equity and inclusion here. When is the end date for the ramps removal and replacements? There, there isn't one. I would say it's, it's. I'm not saying it's a perpetual program that we have in the city, but it is. <laughs> it does a, seem like a. Perpetual. It is an ongoing, and again, it goes directly back to funding, mm -hmm. um, and and then prioritization of that funding. So it's. I mean, we we could we could go as deep as you would like to go in terms of budgetary constraints, the magnitude of the problems, and you know how we're 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 trying to look at all. And again, from the last comment too, we're trying to look at all aspects of the transit system. So when we get as into the transportation fee. We're just letting, from a staff perspective and what was developed in the TSP, these were the priorities that were laid out. Working with council, operations and maintenance was in our street uh, street preservation standards is kind of the priority. But when we get into like the, those other questions of yeah. programs and capital, that's what we wanna look at saying, well, if we want, if what's the rate tolerance that we wanna do? What's the revenue we're trying to, trying to generate? And then what do we wanna do with that revenue? Because the higher the, 
basically the higher the fee, the more revenue, the more things the city can do. And that includes, do we want to do capital? And if so, then when do we, where do we want to prioritize those capital dollars? That's all part of this discussion that's going to occur. So if we say we would I like see. to- we'd I like thought to, that was kind of more of a past. No. So it's, this is connected to- It is. It's, as I, well as all those other buckets. Yeah. And so okay. one of the things we'll get to is because we're going to hit a tolerance point probably with what can be accomplished with the transportation fee, but we still have not resolved all the needs of the community. Right. So what other tools are in the toolbox at that point that we may want to go explore to get more revenue, whether it's grants or trying to solve the transit problem as well. So this is not the only thing within the tra transportation system that we're trying to solve. Um, this is one component of it. But we're also we are also we would love to find sustainable funding for transit because the city is is helping supplement the transit system right now through our budget. And again, but that's another request of the voters. So the key thing to understand here is. Yes, there's a lot of grants. Yes, there's a lot of federal money. It's very competitive. It's very challenging to get. Um, and unfortunately, the federal, you know, where we used to get money, that is those that those funds are drying up. Or, or think of gas tax. Those are those are decreasing funds as we look at alternative fuels. So a lot of it comes down to even with our utility system, it's incumbent upon the community to solve a lot of these problems. So we realize when we go for an additional request of funding. It affects everybody. We're ratepayers in the city as well. We're just not city employees. It affects everyone. And we want to make sure that we're doing this in, in an appropriate way and meeting the challenges of the community and the desires of the community. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Tim. We Thank will you. get back to you. <laughs> I you. think there's many, many interested folks. If you have any questions, please. I know Cheryl will help us just reach out to Sarah directly or through, through your rep. Thank you. And well, on the sake of time, we're going to move on. And we have uh, Allison with us. Allison, she is always here doing all kinds of things. And now she's with Janet Sarai Gerandi, a consultant with Libre Strategies. Talk to us about the core Latinx business outreach. Bienvenidas. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. Hola a todos. Um, I'm Allison Platt. I work for the city of Bend. I work in our economic development. Sorry. Um, I work in our economic development department or division within our community and economic development department. And um, I, I realized today, like I'm probably gonna dive into a topic of urban renewal and core area, the core area tax and commit finance plan. I don't have a lot of time today to provide an in-depth background on what urban renewal and tax and commit financing is. I'm happy to do that at another time if desired, but we really wanted to do a deep dive with HREC on some of the outreach work that we've been doing to support um, some of the programs that we're developing with the core area funds. Um, and I've had the honor of working with Yannette. Um, so I'll let Yannette introduce herself while I figure out all this uh, technology <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Yannette. Um, I use AI in Spanish or they, them, and English pronouns. Um, it's been a pleasure to um, embark on this journey with Allison. Um, it's been a couple of years since we started this project, um, and it has been um, uh, eye-opening, I think, for not only myself, but for Allison and for some of this work that is um, intentionally being brought for a community that is often left behind. Um, so we want to start talking about some of the events that we did, some of the outreach um, and the one-on-one -on -one engagement, which is really important. Um, if you're not familiar with, with the core area, um, feel free to look at the, the map that's there. It identifies where it is, um, kind of the boundary lines. And what's interesting and unique about this area is this has the highest population of Latino-owned businesses, um, also Latino residents um, in that area too, uh, unofficially, because our census data is not always accurate and reflective of those things. Uh, but the reason why you know the focus was on, on these uh, businesses was because these are long-established businesses that have been in this area for a long, long time. Um, and we don't see as much participation coming out of these um, businesses and residents. And so it was important to reach out in a meaningful and impactful way to them. Um, so something that we did, we put together a Noche de Loteria um, or a bingo night, um, loosely translated. 
And in, at this event, um, we utilized the space at the Latino Community Association um, and invited business owners, entrepreneurs, community members to come and network, um, share about their business experiences, what's been working, what's not working, what support they need, um, who else they can uh, kind of get support from outside of obviously the city. Uh, we had a great turnout. I think Allison said it was probably the most well attended that was Latino focused. Um, the event was all in Spanish. It was conducted by myself and my work partner, Jose Barcazar, um, who's a longtime resident here and, and also has a Latino or consulting business for Latino uh, community. So we hosted this event. Um, we gave away prizes. We played games. We talked about sort of what the city does, what the permit process is and things like that. Um, and it was, it was, like I said, very well attended and also high participation rates at the meeting. Um, in addition to that, we also conducted individual interviews with four business owners, um, Colima Market, um, Panchitos, I'm gonna forget some of the names, Don, Gavino. Don Gavinos and uh, Margarita's Bridal. Those are the four businesses. And in addition to this presentation, we had another one where it goes a little more in depth about the interview and, and their comments. I think their report was to sent to Patreon. Yeah, um, so they should have gotten okay. it. Um, we also um, participated in the Alpenglow Community Park Celebration, which was great. And we did some outreach for Midtown Crossings. Um, we also set up a little table at Colima Market and did the same thing, encouraged folks to participate in this um, Midtown Crossing options, and, and we got, I think, some pretty good participation rates from that too. Um, and then another outreach event we participated in is the Latino Community Association's Tianguis or Flea Market. Um, these are sort of mobile vendors that set up outdoors that don't have a storefront, and the Latino Community Association per periodically puts these on to encourage those mobile vendors to come set up, sell their product, get to know the community, et cetera. And just before you jump to the next slide, just to pro provide a little bit more context of what, you know, why were we doing this, these outreach events, um, primarily to build relationships, but with the core area urban renewal district, we actually have the opportunity to provide um, grants or, or funding opportunities for businesses. And so, um, you know, I think it's one thing to do outreach, but when you actually have something to offer, it, <laughs> there's a whole other um, level to it. And so we wanted to make sure as we were developing um, business programs that we were hearing directly from businesses on what their needs were. And this effort was actually jointly funded um, with the core area funds, as well as with a partnership with the Ben Chamber. They contributed funds to this outreach effort. Um, and then we also partnered with our business advocacy fund within the city of Ben. So that was kind of the fruition of why we started doing this outreach. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, it, and I think it's also really important to highlight that the outreach that was done and conducted was high touch. Um, it was oftentimes in person. It was showing up on site at locations. It was conducted primarily by myself, who's a native Spanish speaker, bicultural, multicultural. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, focusing on the equity component, sometimes that's what it takes, right, is us going to the community and meeting them where they're at. We also tried to provide compensation for folks' time anytime we engage with them. So we were able to offer for the, um, for the Noche de Loteria, we offered awards for folks that participated in that. Mm -hmm. And then we offered gift cards whenever we were doing interviews or things like that. And we were able to kind of figure out a way to do that through Yannette's contract um, so that the city didn't carry that burden, but that we were able to kind of have Yannette um, manage those. Uh, I can't remember the name of that, but anyway, those those um, <laughs> incentives. <laughs> Stipends. Stipends, yeah. Just stipend. I was like, what, yes. what is that word again? <laughs> I'm pregnant, so words are tough these days. <laughs> so we want to talk a little bit about some of those key takeaways that we learned um, from these interviews and from, from these community events that we hosted. Um, the first takeaway, um, which is, is something very um, significant, and there's a lot of traction around it, and I want to come back to that point after we go through this list. Um, so takeaway number one, Latino businesses, Latinos, excuse me, are ready to engage and would like to see more business networking opportunities with other Latino business owners. Um, also, uh, another takeaway was that the, the folks who participated in the interview, uh, all of them noted that they had not been able to access the same incentives for opportunities for funding. So when you think about things like ARPA funds, federal dollars that came through, these folks were not aware that these opportunities existed. And if they were aware, there was a reason why they did not um, participate or ask for, for that kind of um, 
funding. And some of that is, again, lack of awareness. There's a language barrier also that needs to be addressed. Um, a lot of our, some of our Latino community do not hold a, a social security number. They work through either an individual taxpayer number or their business um, EIN number. So that obviously discourages them from applying for, for funding. Um, and then another takeaway was also that the um, ownership of the business often ended up being uh, under a child's name or a relative, close relative, or even a business partner, again, because of the lack of that SSN mm -hmm. number. Takeaway three, um, I think this is a problem we can all relate to, <laughs> lack of affordable options to start or expand their business um, and their operations. And then takeaway four, again, talking about the mobile vendors, um, how these folks don't necessarily have a storefront or, or uh, you know, something set up where they can not only make or produce their products, but also sell them and offer them to the public. So that's another barrier too. Um, and for mobile vendors specifically that work out of their home or, or their vehicles, the permitting process is extremely difficult for them to navigate. Um, and then uh, of course, lack of affordable storefront spaces prevents them from having an actual um, brick and mortar. Uh, takeaway five, lack of pathways to store ownership and wealth building. Again, with this other takeaway, knowing that businesses are not registered under the primary business owner's name, or excuse me, business, the person who's working the business, um, that creates this gap or this barrier for folks to actually build the wealth that's necessary for them to expand operations, for them to open a second location, et cetera. Um, so that was another key takeaway. And I just, again, circling back to the takeaway one, um, not only with this work through the core area uh, project, but also through some of work, some other work independently that I've been doing with Central Oregon Inter Intergovernmental Council, COIC, their rural community building um, program is uh, an incredible one. And a lot of outreach has been done through that as well. And some of the takeaways there are that Latinos want to get involved. They want to engage, they want to participate in surveys. They wanna show up for meetings like this, but they need to know how, they need it to be accessible. And so part of this takeaway one has produced an opportunity for us to create our own Hispanic or Latino, Latinx, Latine chamber so that business owners and entrepreneurs are better supported um, in this rural region. Any questions so far? Well, we'll keep going then. <laughs> Um, so just wanted to provide an update on kind of what has been done, at least since a lot of this outreach effort has taken place. So um, since Yannette and I started this project, the city has now hired Spanish speaking um, permit counter staff. So we now have a Spanish speaker that works at our um, permit center counter um, every day unless he's sick. So that has been a huge transformation for folks to have more access to just asking questions um, about how to access um, you know, the permitting process in general. Um, it's just one small piece. It's definitely not this, not the and, entire and, solution. And they've become quite popular. So word, word gets around quick. And so folks are eager to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and then we are working with our customer service staff and our community development department on developing some Spanish how-to videos for, you know, how to get a permit both in person and online, um, how to even just set up an account with our online permitting software. Um, how to get or renew your business license. That's a pretty common question that we get at the city. Um, how does the city store my information? That was a question that I think is really particular to this to the Latino community that we wanted to address in these videos. Um, how to get a mobile vendor permit, um, typically for food. And I think we, we also want to collaborate with the county since a lot of times um, there's questions around uh, services that Deschutes County um, Health and Human Services monitors versus what the city of Bend monitors. So you know, to, to the user, they don't really know, you know, is the city <laughs> monitoring that or is the county monitoring that? Um, so we're hoping to kind of collaborate. And then again, kind of one of our other common permits is how to get a house or commercial remodel permit. Um, we have also adopted the core area business assistance program, uh, which I wanna talk to you a little bit more in depth today since we're getting ready to launch the first round of applications for that program. And then we want to continue to use this um, as a model to support other efforts in Central Oregon community. So I know Yannette um, has kind of taken some of the work that she's done and, and coordinated with COIC on how could we replicate some of this outreach in Redmond or Madras. I don't know if you have more to add. 
Yeah, uh, the focus there being on rural communities. So Jefferson County, um, Madras, Culver, Victoria, those areas, also Prineville, um, often um, sort of seen as outside of city limits, obviously, um, but for the Latino community that either works or lives in those outlying areas and commutes in and out of Bend, um, the, we're all part of the same community and there's only so many of us here. So whether we're in Prineville or we're in Bend, um, these issues are affecting all of the Latino communities across this region. And so COIC sees that importance to have this work focused on first those rural outlying areas and seeing how we can tie it all in together. Um, I see Sergio has his hand up. Uh, question, does the city uh, track uh, who's uh, Hispanic or any other minority-owned business, or is just this uh, 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 a specific program? Meaning, if the, if already there are 100 mid-sized uh, Hispanic business, can we reach those businesses to help, help the little business? Um, one challenging part of this project is we don't actually have any demographic information on our businesses within the city of Bend. Um, so our business license registration, we don't ask for that type of information. I'm not sure we're allowed to. I'd, I'd have to ask. He is right behind you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that would be good information for us to even um, have or store. So um, it is a it one of the kind of challenges of this project was how how do we um, find those businesses without having that good data or that good information because we we don't um, track that. And so a lot of the outreach and the businesses that we did outreach to were more just knowing anecdotally that those businesses were there. Um, and it's a lot harder when we're talking about LGBTQ um, owned businesses, women owned businesses, BIPOC owned businesses. It's really hard to identify um, where those businesses are in the district. And that's kind of one of the other reasons why we focused on um, Latino and Latinx owned businesses in the core area because we had a general sense of what some of them were um, and the language barrier is obviously a huge barrier and it's our fastest growing um, demographic in, in Central Oregon. So um, I have a couple questions that I actually want to uh, piggyback from Sergio's question. Um, what was the um, the contracting process? Uh, we have one consultant but is the city, was there like a pool of different consultants? How can the city work with other consultants so that we're not leaving communities behind mm -hmm. um, and that we're working collaborative? collaborative. Um, and then the second question is regarding uh, the questions asked to the participants. Uh, were any of them business owners? I mean, not business owners, obviously, they're all business owners. Were any of them landowners? Did they own the physical building? So at any time, their rent could go on up and they could be kicked out. Seems like that's a yeah, key. Yeah, I think it was on the takeaway five. None of the Latino and business owners that we engaged with owned their store or their business space. Um, so, And we did ask for information from them on their, on their rental rates. Um, and there was definitely fear, I think, from mm -hmm. some of the business owners about um, concerns around displacement. Um, to answer your first question, um, I don't know if I, I might answer that at the end, but uh, Yannette was selected through a sole, um, sole source contract. So um, I had met with her initially when we are providing contracts for under a certain amount. Um, we're able to, this probably doesn't sound very great, but we're able to kind of skip the process of getting three bids from three different consultants um, because the contract amount was under a certain amount. Um, and then we did include some provisions in Yannette's contract that were sort of outside of normal to, to make kind of better accommodations to, I think, support a woman-owned, um, Latina-owned owned consulting firm that doesn't typically do business with the city of Bend because we have pretty um, challenging consulting requirements to work with. We, we require very high- I think your um, bidding processes is all white men, to be honest. No. <laughs> yeah, so um, we require pretty high insurance requirements mm -hmm. Um, we were able to provide um, kind of a separate track for Yannette as long as she um, was able to increase her car insurance. And then we were able to kind of provide her an administrative fee um, to cover that. So we did try to do some things to make her contract more accessible. And then with the um, stipend programs, we were able to, um, she was able to kind of do like a fast tracked, you know, like 
we were able to turn her invoices over in a 15 day period instead of our standard 30 day period. And she was able to pre invoice us for some of the stipends that she needed to purchase in advance so that she didn't have to front those costs. Um, in advance. So we did try to do some things. So it's been a learning experience for the city also yes. in like the internal process of how definitely <laughs> how can we actually have good partnerships with community organizations. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing up that point, Joanne, because it was uh, it was very challenging. And, and Allison and I had these discussions, you know, early on. Just just the insurance requirement alone was um, a, a task. <laughs> yeah, and usually through. like smaller organizations have to piggyback of a larger nonprofit that will vouch for them to help. So I'm glad that we are kind of looking at those limitations too. Um, a couple questions. One, what is that certain amount? Um, so the city manager is allowed to sign contracts up to 30,000, um, but typically under 10,000 is where we're able to do a direct appointment contract. Okay. And then, um, so you, for this focus was for specific businesses that were anecdotal select, selection, selected because you knew anecdotally. For future, I mean, considering this is kind of an ongoing process, mm -hmm. for future, would it be helpful, I'm curious, to connect with other Latino owned businesses beyond this core area to learn from their experience and how to build that? Yeah, and, and at least the outreach, the Noche de Loteria, we did invite a larger, broader array of businesses. So we even had a business that um, operates out of Redmond. We had a woman that runs like a, or a tire. Yeah, oh, well, the, uh, the mobile, um, she, uh, like, no, um, sewing. The seamstress. Oh, oh seamstress. yeah, <laughs> repair. Right? So close alteration. Yeah. yeah. Um, Is that correct? Socorro. Socorro is Yeah. 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 Um, so we tried to do a little bit broader at the beginning, but because we were trying to really develop program parameters for the core area business assistance program that is only eligible to businesses within the core area, that's why we did like a deeper dive on core area businesses. It was like, again, we, know we, there can, are more we can ask that. everybody what they need, but if you don't have a tool to help address it, you know, not that it's not important to know that, but it like, we wanted to focus on an area where we actually had resources to provide, uh, if that makes sense. But I, I would love to Because we do know there are more in that zone, right? Yes. Yeah. But I'm just thinking for future, did, you know, learning we opportunities. Did try to interview like up to nine. Yeah, so, so the initial phase of the outreach was me physically going to almost every recognizable Latino-owned business and, and folks that I knew personally from my decade long of being here. And from, from that initial invitation, these four were selected because they, they were very eager to participate. Um, and so we didn't conduct the interviews with all of the business owners because some of them you know, weren't interested, didn't have the time, yeah. et cetera, whatever the reason was. We have not wanted to share that information that you just posted, <laughs> but, right? But, and, and, I, and I just wanted to jump in and say that one of, one of my big learning experiences from this was that the, the relationships that I, the existing relationships that I have and the new relationships that I have with the Latino community, um, folks are wanting to know why. Why just the core area? Why doesn't yeah. this, why isn't it one block over? I was just discussing this with, Al with Allison. A friend of mine is opening a pizza restaurant and it's just outside of the parameter of, of this. And his question was, why can't you guys just move it over the line? <laughs> you know, if it was up to me, obviously sure. it'd be much yeah. easier. But, but so yes, yeah, so the need is there to go beyond just the core area. This was again, I think incentivized because of the, the business tax increment and what's gonna happen to that area. It was important for, I think, Allison to identify before that starts happening, who, the, who, who resides there, who has a business there, what do they need and, and how are we gonna be able to support them in the future? Thank you. Another thing that I really appreciate is that for to extend outside the core, we need to get the county and central Oregon intergovernmental council to pitch in financially. And this report gets us that documentation, right? It goes from anecdotal to something more formal that can, you know, um, continue to document the issues that people are facing and the solutions that people want. Uh, and, so yeah. and I'm not necessarily advocating for that. I, I don't know enough about that. I was just curious, why not learn from other Latino owned businesses yeah. throughout to kind of 
support those in the core. Yeah. You know, I, I think the challenge and that's just there, time and energy, right? And, and the challenge yeah. there is not having something sort of tangible to offer those yeah. businesses and saying, yeah. "What do you need?" But how are we going to provide that, right? right? And so waiting until that happens is it's. I get it. Yeah, that's a, that's a catch. Yeah, I guess. Thank you. Um, and we also made a pretty intentional effort to not like map uh, all the you know we kind of created like an inventory internally of mm -hmm. like what were all the businesses that we were going to outreach to, but we made an intentional effort like in any of the outreach materials that we produced to not like map um, any of these businesses because potential unintended consequences of doing that. So mm -hmm. uh, that was another just internal conversation that we had as well. Uh, so I'm gonna dive into the business assistance program. So this is a brand new program. We used a lot of the outreach that we did to help inform the development of this program. Uh, but this program is also serving lot, you know, lots of business needs in the core area. So it was ultimately kind of established by our core area advisory board. Um, the need for this program is much larger than the amount of funding that we have to offer through this program. But we hope that this program continues to grow um, and the amount of funding that we can offer continues to grow over time. The way that urban renewal works is today we have the most limited amount of funds that we will have in this funding bucket. Um, and it will only continue to increase over the next 30 years. Um, again, I don't have like time to do a deep dive into urban renewal, but um, that's just kind of the, the basics of it. So this is a new grant program that would provide grants up to $50,000 per recipient. Um, but, but with the caveat that currently we're only funding this program with $100,000 annually. And with the goal of growing the program over time, but right now it's, it, that's its <coughs> capacity. <laughs> Um, so this program is really intended to support both internal and external building improvements for core area businesses. Um, so eligible applicants would include um, tenants or business owners, but they would need to have owner authorization. And that's just because we can't authorize improvements to be made or provide funds for improvements to be made without the property owner having some consent for those improvements to be made to their, to their property. But some of the examples of what could be funded with this program would include like new doors, windows, lighting, siding, um, awnings, uh, murals, si sidewalk improvements, ADA accessibility improvements, landscaping, um, utility improvements to the inside of the building, anything to help an older building meet current code requirements, mechanical, electrical, or building safety upgrades, um, energy efficiency improvements. You can also use this for pre-development assistance, so architectural and engineering costs. And then for city of like for permitting fees, including the city of Ben permitting fees. Yeah, and I see Sergio uh, raise his hand. I um, this slide um, has some interesting things. When I see all of that, I see that our tax dollars are going to support those landowners raise their property value, which is not necessarily what we're intending. So, is there a clause in there that will you know, basically incentivize loan owners to like, if you receive this benefit, you're going to leave this property for this business at this rent for this X amount of time. Otherwise, you know, we will be advocating for gentrification. Yeah, so, and that's, I think, so I totally hear your concern. And part of urban renewal is increasing property tax value. That is really the intent of how of how an urban renewal district um, works because we are taking tax dollars away from the taxing districts and we promise them that we will use this tool to raise the tax base higher than it would have without this tool. We're going to invest in this area. However, we also recognize that urban renewal has been used as a tool um, that has caused gentrification. We want to be really mindful of avoiding that. And so part of this program, I'll get into it kind of on the next one or two slides of how we structured the evaluation scoring is really to prioritize um, certain types of businesses that might be undercapitalized. And then we do require uh, multi-year lease and tenant, or so multi-year lease options for businesses that apply because we, we did want to avoid a business, you know, applying for these funds and then the next year their, their landlord kicking them out. So them having, you know, at least a five-year lease or an option to renew. We also, like we had a big conversation about you know, some businesses don't want to be too locked into a lease. Like if it's an eight-year lease, but maybe they only want a three-year lease. 
um, because they might want to move. Grow. We didn't want to require that you had to have an eight-year lease, right? So we gave kind of the option of you need to be able to have a multi-year lease with options for renewal so that you have the option as a business owner um, to continue your, your lease in that space. We didn't include as strict requirements as you're suggesting, Joanne, I think that we'd be totally open in the future to, to reevaluating the requirements. I think after this grant cycle, um, we intend to kind of continually monitor and update the program policies. I think that's a great suggestion, but I'll, I, I like want to write it down, but I, I'll keep it in my like parking lot of like potential improvements to, um, to the program policy over time. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Hill, do you have a question? It's it just a comment, it may be a question, but if you have a $100,000 and you're going to be allocating 50, so basically you're helping two businesses. Uh, it, was there any thought about doing things that help $10,000, 10 businesses, so you have more of a multiplier effect? That's just the max grant. I think if I get to the next slides, I'll help answer some of these questions. <laughs> Can I just jump in real quick on, on the point that Joanne made? Because that was a, an early discussion that um, that we had had and we actually um, took some time to do a little research in what's happened in other cities and areas surrounding. Portland's a great example of urban renewal, gentrification, and the things that have happened of displaced, not only residents, business owners, um, essential um, services for Latino or migrant communities that are being you know, taken away because of the cost. And so that was definitely something that we talked about and discussed. And it's something that I think um, to the extent possible has been embedded in, into that application process. And knowing to your point that yes, um, ultimately the equity is going to the landowner. However, these businesses would not exist without the opportunity for leases. And so we're kind of in, in a, between a rock and a hard place in determining how best to, to provide that support while also recognizing that it's still not creating a path to ownership for these folks unless they're able to purchase outside of their lease or wherever they're currently situated. Yeah, absolutely. And just for the community, I don't think that the point of equity is that, uh, you know, we leave landowners with no benefit, but that the benefit is equally shared. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So yeah, so just a little bit about what is required in order to be eligible for this program. So you do need to be a business located within that core TIF area. We recognize that that creates like a just very distinct boundary of who is in and who is out, but that's just the funding source um, that we have to offer to these businesses comes directly from the, this boundary is, is the boundary that those funds can be spent in. Um, it, they do need to have an existing or planned ground floor commercial use. So um, you couldn't have, I mean, a residence like on the ground floor wouldn't be eligible, um, but anywhere where there is a business on the ground floor would be eligible to apply for this grant. And we wrote, we tried to write that in a way where mobile vendors would also be eligible for the program. Um, so we wanted like food carts to also be eligible with that within that definition. Um, and then business tenancy must be demonstrated either through owning the site, having a lease for the site, or at least having a letter of intent to lease the site. So you need to, your applicants will have to provide um, proof of one of those. Um, the proposed improvements need to comply with applicable city of Bend standards. So you, know, you couldn't propose, if like our sign code says your sign needs to be five feet, you couldn't be proposing like a 30 foot sign or something like that. It would need to um, generally when it is building needs to comply with our requirements. Um, so I think I kind of covered everything on that. And then this is, I think, will help answer Sergio's question. So the way that this, pro this program works is there's two tracks that you can apply for. The first one would be applying for design assistance. And this would be a business that maybe wants to make improvements to their business, but has no idea where to even start. Um, and we would actually, we're, we're pursuing um, the ability for the city to actually hire design and architecture firms to provide directly to businesses that are selected for this program. So they don't even have to do any due diligence of like finding a designer or finding an architect, architect to work with. Um, so we're planning on hiring these design firms to offer to those businesses that are selected for this, for this design assistance grant um, that would provide kind of conceptual renderings and different design concepts for the improvements that they could make to their business. And then they would also be provided with three contractor bids for how much those improvements would cost. And the goal is to hopefully set up some businesses to be able to apply for the second track of the program which is construction assistance to actually apply to physically build the improvements. 
Um, and what we we modeled this these two tracks off of a program that Beaverton, Oregon has, and they've found that 60% of the um, applicants or the awardees of their design assistance grant are BIPOC owned businesses, and 80% of those do move forward with construction um, projects on their sites. So that was something that we felt like was really um, beneficial and we wanted to provide that track for folks to be able who, who may have like no idea where to even begin or start to, to be able to start to enter into this grant program over time. Um, so that second option, we think that that will also help kind of like maybe not all the funds will go to two projects that will get some smaller amount projects that we could fund with that. Um, and then the second option is through a construction assistance grant. So the max, a grant, the max grant amount that could be provided is 50,000, um, but that's not to say that any one awardee will get that much. And there are cash match requirements for this one. So if a business was applying for just under $10,000 in grant assistance, they wouldn't need to provide any match. Um, and the committee had a lot of really um, good feedback on that of wanting to provide a very low barrier entry into this program, especially for businesses that don't have that cash match requirement. And then if you were applying for funding assistance between 10,000 to 25,000, you need to provide a 25% match. And then if you're applying for over 25,000, you need to have 50% match. Um, again, this is kind of where we're starting out with this program. We're, we would really like to see how this first round of applications goes. And we're open to modifying some of these requirements moving forward. Allison, are you working, working with any lenders also in case folks need to come with their matching funds? Yeah, I think we at least have contacts that we can direct folks to. So um, Jeff Baker from Craft3 is on the advisory board that I've been working on. So I oftentimes will direct folks to Craft3 since they're a community development focused lending firm that can offer lower interest rates, especially for um, BIPOC or kind of undercapitalized businesses. And then there's also the SBA loan programs that the city has connections to that we can direct folks to um, that also provides loans kind of for folks who have a harder time accessing um, traditional forms of capital. Wonderful. Have you considered at all? Um, I understand that you're, what you're saying about this program is in its early stages and you're evaluating all these things, but just curious, have you considered at all um, offering forms of match that are not cash, like labor or time that the employee or the owner is is contributing to the project? Yeah, so if like they were, um, if they were like doing all of the work, but like needed funding buying the paint, for right. example, um, we could include that as sort of an in cash. Let us, yeah, let me follow up with like legal on kind of uh, how we would, um, monitor all those things because I haven't I haven't thought about it in that detailed way. So um, we would need some type of basis mm -hmm. to do that. So that's a good question. I actually don't know the specific answer to that. I'll follow up. To well, match their labor hours. I don't know. Yeah, usually that. like uh, volunteer hours are 2650 nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so you will consider like an in-kind donation. I guess that's the nonprofit world term yeah. I don't know how it would be uh but yeah basically thank you Arnold. great idea yeah that, I think that's uh, a great idea I will definitely follow up if it's not something that we can incorporate kind of in this first cycle of funding it's definitely something that we can um evaluate for the future um future of the policy and just for timekeeping considerations we are at time but if there are further questions I don't want to um, stifle those if some folks want to ask some wrap-up yeah, I mean, we just had two two questions for HREC members is just, do you have general feedback on the outreach effort that we did or ways um, to improve that in the future or to establish better relationships with businesses in the future? And then um, do you have additional, I think you've already kind of provided some, but do you have additional feedback for how to ensure equitable access to this program um, moving forward? And just to kind of provide another update, we've um, amended Yannette's contract using some of the existing funding that was in it so that she can provide application assistance to applicants applying. Um, so we're planning to offer kind of like two office, she'll do some tailored outreach once the program materials are available and the applications live. Um, but then we will set up kind of office hours essentially if there is an applicant, um, particularly that doesn't speak English, that does speak Spanish. We don't have like Vietnamese um, translation assistance quite established yet. We're trying to work on just this one <laughs> first. Um, but if there is a business that does want to apply, um, 
we'll have Yannette kind of host office hours to walk them through every application question and help them um, actually get their application in. So that is something that we are planning to do with this program um, when the application, this first application cycle goes live. I appreciate how realistic you are with just like not jumping full, right? And just being aware of how long it takes. And I think that's awesome. So thank you. Yeah, so you want it to be successful, right? And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of scramble for that money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> once, once the word gets out, right? Would you jump back to the earlier slide where you had some of the outcomes from the interviews, some of the key takeaway points? Yeah. So I guess I'm going to ask respond to your question with a question. And that is, you know, from takeaway two, and I heard a lot of what you talked about where there was sort of a lack of awareness and then the overall language barriers. So as, this, as you all are trying to find and get more information from more businesses and really get more engagement, I guess the question coming back to you all is from the experiences you've had and opportunities and hearing what you've heard at least from the individual businesses and then from the bingo night, um, what other ideas, options, thoughts are you all entertaining to try to you know, get out there and get that engagement? Um, because I would assume you know, all the typical methods are there, but then other methods and strategies are gonna have to be sort of engaged. Yeah, so one of the, the points that we talked about, and sorry if I went through it real quick, oh, <laughs> I was trying to keep good. us on schedule. Um, was one of the outcomes being that key takeaway is that Latinos are ready to engage. They want to network, but there isn't a place for them to do that without right. it being just the Chamber of Commerce, which again, is not in their language. It's maybe not at times that are good for them, or they're just not familiar with that community and don't feel safe accessing it. So from some of this outreach work and then in, in kind of partnership with COIC, the work that I've been doing there and identifying that there is a real need for some sort of network group, for some sort of, um, networking opportunity for folks to go not only to share resources among each other, but to bring up those topics of this is what's happening in, in the core area, but what's happening in Redmond, what's happening in Prineville, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that if that lives within COIC, then we keep open communication with the city of Bend, with the city of Redmond, et cetera, so that they're aware of what is coming out of this networking group and what the priorities and needs are. Essentially like a Latino chamber. Uh, and so on that, I'm sure social media and LCA, and those are all already tapped avenues that get people talking, right, of opportunities like this. Yeah, so, so one thing I think it's important to identify is that um, the folks that are accessing the nonprofit services such as Latino Community Association aren't always the same ones that are sure. entrepreneurs or business owners. Sometimes they are, sometimes there's crossover. Mm -hmm. So our, our core audience isn't necessarily the clients of LCA, although they are a great, you know, partner to disseminate yeah. the information, to invite, to promote it, to get the word out. This is in the very, very early kind of formation stages with COIC. So we aren't even to a point yet of outreaching to let them, to let the community know this is happening. I see. Okay. There's, there's a lot of, as you know, red tape Stuff on that do. side yeah. to do first <laughs> and then, and then we'll get to that point. I was thinking of those, um, and I don't know enough about it, but the, uh, uh, employer supported housing through core, I guess it was. And you know how they, you know, do the ads everywhere of like application being taken now, that type of thing. So when will that happen? Um, so we're planning to for the business assistance yeah. program, we're planning yeah. to launch the hopefully launch the application before I leave on maternity leave, which is the end of this month. Um, so I'm hoping the application opens Today? July, or sorry, June, June, June 3rd. <laughs> June 3rd. I get you, yeah. Good um, job. The application will hopefully launch by July. Great. Okay. And then the That's application fantastic. will be open through the end of October. Um, so we'll be doing um, outreach and then that's kind of we have Yannette on board to help do like more of that high touch outreach so texting mm -hmm. all the businesses that we've made relationships with to let them know that the applications live when those office hours will be if they want to apply um, and then kind of even like offering flyers with QR codes I think there's yeah. some Facebook um, channels that particularly the Latino community uses that will try to utilize things like that but um, having her kind of be more embedded in the community. We work with her to help us identify like what the best methods are to do that. So. 
and one th like one cool, really cool thing that we had never done like the the bingo night or the loteria night we hosted that on a Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. I've like, the city does not host events on Sunday evenings, but <laughs> Yannette was like, that's the best time. That's like family day. That's Aaron's day. Like that's when we should host this event. So I was like, okay, I'll work Sunday evening. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just kind of really like getting out of the box of like, what does the city typically do? And we're like trying to change the model to a new like community where they're at. That's great. Thank you. So, we do have one more item to which we will not be able to get this evening, uh, which is our subcommittee reviews and check-in. Oh, sorry. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Allison, Thank you Janet. Very much. Also, please. Okay, we have more comments, but they're just emailing me. Can we, so Cassandra, to your point, should we, if we have thoughts on this, funnel them to you, funnel them back directly? What, yeah, please funnel them to me and I can resend those two questions from Allison's presentation to, if you if you'd like just to have more thoughts and we can share it then with Yannette and Allison going forward. Get a copy of the presentation? Yes, that um that should be included. I'll send it out again though. Yeah. Oh, if you already yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. It's okay. Yeah, we're getting ready to launch the business assistance web page, so I'll make sure to send that out to Cassandra as well. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and, and thank you, Cassandra, for helping us be the point person. I would appreciate if you also, uh, I know that we cannot like collaborate, but you can share what everybody shares with you. Um, and I think it will be valuable. Uh, I will appreciate just like, I learned so much from Jeff and Aaron today with their questions that I want to see, you know, like what comes up from the group, if that's okay. Yeah, I can share a, a, a document that would be in, in compliance with our public meetings and records law. Thank you. So folks, um, I believe that uh, the check-ins on these work groups is best fit for the next meeting. Um, yeah, and I would say, Joanne, if I could just have a minute and then we can kind of orient ourselves to figure out what next steps we want to take and just a high level overview of what we've done. And then we can jump into now between now and the June meeting, of like what we want to establish. Um, I think we had five about five minutes for it and we'll we'll yield for public comment, too. And then we can. Oh, we can... I thought we were done at six, it's 630. Yeah. OK, we still got 15 minutes. My bad. We, no, we were 15 minutes past. No, and we we do have a few things left on the agenda. The agenda setting in bike rack follows that. So I'll just go over this as a high level. Um, so we've we've joined developing an equity framework and operationalizing equity as one group. Um, and they have met once since forming. Um, and these are a few slides from Manoj. These are going to be available to all of you, so I won't go through all of them, and it would be better for Manoj to be giving them um, to you presenting, but it's just based on kind of the input and feedback he received from Aaron and Linda, um, and also just doing some work and research around GARE, which is the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, and looking really into kind of the lens or framework or equity lens we want to be applying as we move forward. It's in its early stages, but these are just a few of the um, slides that are shared that will continue onward um, in the next meeting, um, in the next subcommittee meeting, I should say. Um, and then he's identified some of these next steps uh, that, that will be um, able to disseminate during that subcommittee meeting and we'll be able to start scheduling things out. And obviously this will be uh, excitingly done in conjunction with Andres uh, when he comes on in, in July and we will have an opportunity to do that then. Any questions about this particular subcommittee before I move on? I know it's high level and it's quick. I just want to maximize our time together. It's only one meeting, so I think it's fair. Okay. Thank you. So we've got the resources in response to discrimination. Um, unfortunately, Renee did give a, let us know that she has been relocated um, outside of Bend and she's having to leave. So she has had to leave HREC, unfortunately. And we've also um, lost her, unfortunately, to uh, this group because I think she lended a wonderful perspective with her background in unions and, and workplace um, workplace gatherings. So just as an update there. So it's uh, Sergio, Manoj, and Steven uh, are in this group currently. And I have a flow chart to kind of indicate the work that's been done and also what needs to occur going forward. This is effectively establishes what the subcommittee will focus on and what the subcommittee will not be focusing on. 
And I'll just page through these. Action arrows, we call them. <laughs> so effectively, we've come up with the idea that uh, the city of Bend will have some sort of form of resource hotline or website um, it, that those logistics and kind of in the in the weeds details are still being ironed out, but we're looking at a high level. So we'll have a formal reporting option that's available and those will utilize uh, the Bureau and Labor and Industries, the Oregon State Department of Justice, the City of Bend Police Department and the EEOC, the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission as some of those ways that formal reporting um, options are available to those individuals who have experienced discrimination in our community. Um, but more immediately, um, we've got the, the, more, the, the more caring side when we get together and, and, and advocate on behalf of individuals um, with looking at partnering them with local resources that are available. So that's really essentially what I think the group has found is, is the, the guiding factor of this. The formal reporting is important, and I think that we get a lot of information and direction from especially the Department of Justice and when we see their hate and bias hotline and what that looks like. But how can we, as 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 Bend being in Human Resources or Human Human Rights and Equity Commission, how can we together partner with, you know, community members who may have discrim experienced discrimination and acts of harm with those appropriate um, resources and organizations? So we're compiling that information in those um, different partnerships in the community and moving from there. And so these oh, are some of oh Sandra, yep. sorry. If if DOJ already has a website and a hotline, why did the group decide to replicate that for the city of Bend? I don't think there's any duplication meant. What it means is essentially that if the report or some sort of information came in, that the individual would be able to say, these are the places that you can go. There's no duplication in creating the hotline. It's to say the Department of Justice, the Oregon Department of Justice has this hotline that you can call. And this is what that looks like. Oh, I'm sorry, because it says City of Bend Resources Hotline. So I'm like, are we creating a City of Bend Hotline? It, we might have something where somebody could call and say, hey, I think this has happened to me. What, what can I do about it? So I wouldn't necessarily say it's going to be staffed by any means, like a 24-7 hour, you know, kind of thing that Saving Grace might have or, you know, depending on what, what, um, what they look like with a DOJ, right? But it is something that potentially we could say, hey, we're a resource and now we can route you to the right place. And we're also going to let you know what this process looks like. So we're not just shoving you off to a phone, but saying, this is what you can expect. This is how long the phone call might be. This is the pieces of information that would be important for you to have if you want to share that out. But again, formal reporting is not going to be right for everyone. And that's kind of the idea of having those local resources available. So it sounds to see if I understood Resource correctly. Line. Well, more like navigation. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me that in between the individual experiencing discrimination in Ben and the hotline and website referring, there is another step there of navigation? Um, that may be, right? And, and that's, we're still in, this is not formal by any means. It's just kind of the, the overall draft of what we had. And I invite you to come to the next <laughs> subcommittee meeting and give your input there, because I think that um, we would love that with, with being down a person. So, but for the sake of time and knowing we may have public comment, um, I will move on, but I'm, I, I can follow up offline too, Jerry. Yeah. And these are the primary research kind of questions that are going to compel us forward. So com uh, compilation of the resources that are available in Bend, uh, what demonstrable gaps are present in the services and support, um, and then what formal reporting options are available and what would that look like to somebody who decides to make a formal report. Um, these are just some pieces of uh, websites that are, I think, really effective that help people and folks figure out what they can do and I think are instrumental in kind of guiding the work that we want to do in this particular section. And um, also collaborative governance is in the work. So this is going to have a little to be continued stamp on it. Um, and we're trying to figure out right now with um, members if we want to include kind of a lens into the other two groups or if we want to uh, have some other members join this as well. So that's to be continued and I'll follow up with you all about that as well. Melissa, I turn it over to you. Or, or, sorry, are there any other questions about that? I'll I'll reach out to figure out when when we'll have our next subcommittee meetings and plan that and and move forward into those next steps. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Andrea, so you want to introduce yourself and say hi, or you can just. 
remain anonymous until now. <laughs> <laughs> can y'all hear me? Can, am I heard? We can hear you. Buenos dias, everybody. This is Andres Portela. Thanks for having me in space. I just was listening in. Thank you. Well, welcome. welcome. We're looking forward to see you in the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be in band and on the ground and working with folks. Well, thank you, Andres. Yeah, thanks yeah, for thank the watching. You. Sorry, we put you in the spot and we're going to have to have some um, welcoming kickoff for the next meeting, you know, some botana, some snacks, some, I don't know, some little something to make it fast. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Well, here's our agenda and bike rack. And notably, Joanne, I've just added um, our transportation fee for the proposed by city staff that if we want to have um, folks join that. And then what was another thing that I said? Potentially having Stephanie return for more budgetary questions. So just your time for the next five minutes um, to figure out if there's anything you want added to a future agenda or uh, what you'd like to see us tackle in these next upcoming months. I had one thought. I think it would be really helpful if at the next meeting, um, especially for your comments, Joanna, I think it would be really helpful if we had a conversation as a group of as different committees, uh, groups working for the city, departments are coming to us asking for a review, for perspectives, for help, for participation. I think it would be good to just establish a, a process, formal, informal, um, so that we can identify if we do have interest. Capacity, yeah, you urgency. Know, then, yeah, well, it, it's, you know, if there's interest, who's interested, who has time, and then if there's multiple folks, who might be the best person have that open forum and conversation you know where we can have some transparency with each other and then be able to give somewhat of a timely response i mean this you know transportation is yeah. not till august it'll be good to have i think that would be good if we set that as a bar for our next meeting and that's my suggestion to the group i agree with you um at this meeting i know that um where we're always running out of time, but it's always great to have connection with council. Uh, so if Stephanie is our, you know, uh, person to give us a little like snippets, or if Megan can give us a little, you know, driving. <laughs> yeah, but but I think it's important to you know to have that connection. We're not, you know, we're not separate. We're all part of the ecosystem. Am I remembering correctly that that's also like that one of the the roles is kind of a council report back role like in, in I'm sorry in the leadership yes. roles nominations and voting yeah. yeah so there's a safety lead there's a communications position and then it's a um it's a council liaison role and Manoj had um has a little a couple of slides um that he might present with a little bit different um formation of of those roles and to see how folks feel about maybe merging from three to two but we'll leave that for for the june meeting i think as well hi this is megan i'm i'm here if uh if any sorry i had a, a child thing i had to take care of but um i'm here if anyone um I mean, I think Stephanie did a good job of, of updating um, what we've really been up to with council um, recently, which, you know, which is obviously getting that budget um, through the process, but I'm happy to either answer any questions or let you know um, what we'll be talking about um, next Wednesday for our meeting, but um, I'm here. Child safety. <laughs> Please. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Um, I think that um, maybe not at this time, but in the future, it'll be great to revisit Ascension Camping Code uh, because there was some recommendations then we hear in the news that, you know, things are not going as planned. So it's important to, to revisit and, you know, to continue that dialogue. And I'd like to echo my request in the past for uh, overview regarding housing and affordable housing advisory committee. And then once Cheyenne's role is replaced, connection meeting. 
for the homeless leadership coalition. And that seems like a nice natural fit between what you're seeing, Cameron, and then Joanne, like to have those those potentially to get the information from city staff and then look at the code and the, the recommendations that HREC made back in October of 2022 or? Yeah, and also we lost Cheyenne, our uh, first Cheyenne, sorry, Cheyenne at the. So once she's replaced, it'd be great to have, you know, some connection. Yeah, I know I, that's a few months out. Yes, I, I missed the, the name of the center, but that is an important center. The court, the yeah, the coordinated um, houseless response office. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to guess it's going to be a matter of a few months before um, there is a new director of that office. Um, but I can work with um, with Cassandra to kind of figure out maybe a good um, way to get maybe get someone from code enforcement in to talk about how the camping code is actually. Um, you know how it is actually in the field um, to to enforce the camping code, um, and then maybe we can get someone from um, our housing office with the city as well. Thank you. So I'll add all of those to uh, to our future bike rack and agenda, <laughs> which just keeps growing. <laughs> well, Cassandra, thank you so much for keeping us on yes, time. Thank you on um you know on topic and thank you all for being here um this meeting 